In the bone-dry hills of Nevada, beneath pale limestone cliffs carved by wind and time, a man was laid to rest more than 10,000 years ago. He was wrapped in a tule reed mat, buried with rabbit-skin blankets and moccasins, and left in the silence of a desert cave that would preserve him for millennia. To those who found him, he was little more than an archaeological curiosity, an ancient burial from an unknown people. But to modern science, the man from Spirit Cave would become one of the most important witnesses to humanity's first great crossing from Asia to the New World. His bones and DNA tell the story of a bridge between continents, between Ice Age hunters of the East and the first peoples of the Americas. The mystery began when archaeologists working with the Nevada State Parks Commission unearthed the remains in a dry cave along the Stillwater Range. The body was astonishingly well preserved. Hair still clung to the scalp, tendons and skin mummified by the desert air. The man had been carefully buried on his right side, one arm folded beneath his chin, the other across his pelvis. The grave goods, a tule mat, rabbit skin blanket and moccasins made from twisted plant fiber, spoke of a life both humble and intricate. At first, archaeologists thought the burial was no more than a couple of millennia old, but in radiocarbon tests shattered that assumption. The man in Spirit Cave was 10,600 years old, predating nearly all known North American human remains. His preservation, combined with his age, made him a treasure beyond comparison. The discovery sparked fierce debate. To whom did he belong? What people had lived in Nevada's Great Basin so soon after the Ice Age? How was he related to the wizard's beachman found on the Nevada-California border, and why did his skull seem to differ from that of modern Native Americans? When physical anthropologist Douglas Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution and Richard Jantz of the University of Tennessee studied the skull, they found themselves looking at a face that defied easy classification. The spirit cave skull was long and narrow, its vault high and curved, its face relatively short and delicate. The brow ridges were faint, the orbits tall and narrow, and the cheekbones did not flare forward like those of East Asian mongoloid skulls. His frontal bone arched gracefully backward, giving him a profile more reminiscent of Upper Paleolithic Europeans or the ancient Ainu people of Japan than of later Native Americans. When Jansen Owsley compared the skull's measurements against William Howells's global database of human crania, Spirit Caveman consistently clustered with Ainu, Polynesians, and certain European groups. The skulls least like his were those of Native Americans and East Asians. In vault shape, he was closest to the Ainu of northern Japan. In facial projection and prognathism, he resembled Norse and Central European samples. The conclusion startled the anthropological world. Spirit Caveman, at least in form, was non-Mongoloid. His morphology resembled the ancient upper cave skulls from Jokudian in northern China, fossils dating to roughly 35,000 years ago, sometimes called the Chinese Cro-Magnons. These early modern humans showed an astonishing range of cranial variation. Skull 101 had a long, low vault and broad forehead. However, Skull 102 appeared almost Australo-Melanesian, with a robust jaw and tall orbits. They were clearly Asian in geography, but globally diverse in appearance, reflecting a population that had not yet evolved the flattened faces and broad vaults typical of later East Asians. The spirit cave skull fits neatly within that archaic pattern. Like the upper cave people, he belonged to a lineage that had crossed into East Asia before those mongoloid traits became dominant. His long head and narrow face suggest descent from an ancestral population that moved eastward out of central or western Eurasia during the late Pleistocene, mixing with local groups in Northeast Asia before one branch pushed across Beringia into the Americas. Long before spirit caveman's ancestors hunted along the shores of ancient Nevada, their forebears were Arctic voyagers. The most likely path that brought humans from Asia to America ran along the northern rim of the Pacific, linking the volcanic peninsula of Kamchatka to the Commander Islands, Attu in the Aleutians, and finally the Alaskan mainland. Around 30,000 years ago, during the depths of the last glacial maximum, this route reached its perfect moment of possibility. At that time, sea levels were more than 300 feet lower than today, exposing broad shelves and narrowing the distances between islands. 
Critically, the island was likely even visible from a 3,000-foot peak on the Kamchatka coastline. The island chain that today stretches precariously across rough northern seas would then have formed a nearly continuous series of stepping stones, each within sight of the next on clear days. From the southern tip of Kamchatka, travellers could cross only 80 miles to the Commander Islands, rest on seabird-covered cliffs, then make another similar hop to Atu and the western Aleutians before reaching the ice-free refugees of coastal Alaska. Climatically, this was the window of relative stability before the North Pacific currents shifted and before the Bering Land Bridge became choked with wind-blown silt and permafrost. The Western Pacific gyres at that time carried warmer subarctic surface waters northward along the Kuril and Kamchatka coasts, creating pockets of milder climate even amid the glacial cold. These conditions would have sustained kelp forests, seals, sea otters, and abundant fish, an edible highway for Ice Age hunter-gatherers equipped with boats, spears, and knowledge of tides. Between about 32,000 and 28,000 years ago, the vast Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets had not yet merged over central Canada, leaving coastal corridors in the Far East relatively open. Archaeological hints from Kamchatka and the southern Bering Sea suggest human presence by this time. Stone tools and hearths in areas that would soon be submerged as the Ice Age ended. When conditions worsened after 26,000 years ago, Populations already established east of the Bering Strait could have been isolated for millennia on the exposed plain of Beringia, evolving into the founders of the ancient Native American lineage that later gave rise to Spirit Caveman. The Kelp Highway hypothesis, now supported by genetic and oceanographic data, fits perfectly with this timeline. It proposes that maritime peoples followed the rich ecological belt of kelp forests stretching from Japan to California. In the window around 30,000 years ago, this highway would have been most navigable. Ice sheets at their maximum extent locked up enough water to create wide continental shelves, yet temperatures along the Pacific coast remained above the threshold that would freeze bays and estuaries solid. Crossing from Kamchatka to the Commander Islands, early mariners would have relied on driftwood canoes or hide-covered boats, technologies later attested among Arctic peoples. The prevailing westerly winds and the east-flowing subarctic current would have aided their progress rather than hindered it. The distance from Kamchatka to Atu was well within the limits of seafarers at that time. By the time the climate warmed after 20,000 years ago, sea levels began to rise, drowning much of this migration route. Coastal camps vanished beneath the waves, leaving only scattered traces on high ground. But the descendants of those voyagers remained, first in Beringia and later across the Americas. Spirit Caveman's genetic heritage ultimately traces back to that ancient crossing, when Asia and America were one continuous world of ice, sea and courage. For decades the morphology seemed to tell one story, while the archaeology told another. Many wondered whether the first Americans might have come from an earlier non-Mongoloid population, perhaps related to South Asians or Papuans. That debate ended when a team led by Esko Willerslev at the University of Copenhagen extracted DNA from Spirit Caveman's Petrus bone and published their findings in Science. The results were decisive. Spirit Caveman was genetically Native American. His genome belonged to a population called the Ancient Native Americans, a lineage that split from its Siberian ancestors around 24,000 years ago and entered the Americas through Beringia before 15,000 years ago. Around 13,000 years ago, this founding population divided into two great branches – the northern Native Americans who remained in North America, and the southern Native Americans who spread rapidly through Central and South America. Spirit Caveman lived near the root of this split. Genetically, he stood at the base of both northern and southern lineages, a true ancestral link. His mitochondrial DNA belonged to haplogroup C1b, found today from Alaska to Patagonia, especially among Andean and Central American peoples. His Y chromosome was a branch of haplogroup Q, the dominant paternal lineage among indigenous peoples of the Americas. This genetic fingerprint proved beyond doubt that the man buried in the Nevada desert was no outsider. He was an ancestor. 
The revelation that Spirit Caveman was Native American did not erase the morphological puzzle, it deepened it. If he shared DNA with modern indigenous peoples, why did his skull look so different? The answer lies in time and geography. The ancestors of Native Americans evolved in northeastern Asia, where populations were far more diverse during the late Pleistocene than they are today. The mongoloid pattern, flat face, wide cheekbones, and short cranial vault, emerged gradually and regionally, not as a single uniform type. The people who crossed Beringia into the Americas carried an earlier set of traits. Long skulls, moderate faces, and minimal flattening. These were pre-Mongoloid Asians, perhaps similar to the Ainu of Japan or the ancient upper cave population of China. In other words, spirit caveman looked different because he represented a branch of humanity frozen in an earlier stage of East Asian evolution. His descendants, over thousands of years, would gradually develop new cranial forms as they adapted to new diets, climates, and genetic drift within the Americas. The change from Paleo-American to Amerindian skull shapes thus reflects evolution within a single lineage, not separate origins. When Spirit Caveman lived, the Great Basin was a land transformed by meltwater. Vast pluvial lakes, Lake Lahontan and Lake Bonneville, still glimmered in the basins, surrounded by marshes rich with reeds, waterfowl and fish. Herds of antelope grazed in the meadows, sagebrush and juniper covered the hills. Spirit Caveman's people belonged to the early desert archaic tradition, mobile foragers who followed the seasons in search of food. They hunted rabbits and pronghorn with flaked stone points, gathered seeds and crafted tools from bone and fibre. Their shelters were caves and rock overhangs, dry places ideal for storage and burial. The items found with Spirit Caveman, moccasins, mats and blankets, reflect a culture with deep technical knowledge. The moccasins were woven from twisted sagebrush bark, a technique identical to those from Fort Rock Cave in Oregon, also over 10,000 years old. The tule mat, used as both shroud and bedding, shows a mastery of plant processing that required planning and coordination. This was not a primitive people scraping by at the edge of survival. It was a society adapted to its environment, rooted in generations of experience. Genetically, Spirit Caveman sits alongside other key ancient individuals that mark milestones in the peopling of the Americas. In Montana, the Anzic One Child, buried with Clovis stone tools and red ochre 12,700 years ago, represents the earliest known North American genome. He too belongs to the ancient Native American lineage, ancestral to both North and South American populations. In Washington State, the Kennewick Man, dated to 8,500 years ago, initially seemed, like Spirit Cave, to have non-native features. But his DNA revealed close kinship with the Colville tribe and other Pacific Northwest peoples. Taken together, these three individuals, Anzic, Spirit Cave and Kennewick, form a continuous genetic narrative stretching across 4,000 years. Anzic represents the arrival, Spirit Cave the establishment, Kennewick the regional diversification. Each lived in a different landscape, yet all were bound by a single ancestral thread. The study extended its analysis beyond North America. It compared Spirit Cave Man's genome with those of ancient South American remains, including ancient people of Brazil. Despite the immense distance, they were close relatives descendants of the same early wave of settlers that had moved south through the Americas with astonishing speed. Within a few centuries after crossing into the New World, Spirit Caveman's ancestors or their cousins had already reached the southern continent. The DNA link between Nevada and Brazil shows how swiftly humans filled the hemisphere once the path was open. Spirit Caveman is no longer a specimen in a drawer. He is an ancestor whose life and body have expanded humanity's understanding of its shared past. Viewed in full, the spirit caveman bridges not just Asia and America, but morphology and genetics, myth and evidence. His skull speaks of ancient Asian forebears whose features diverged before the rise of modern East Asian populations. His DNA roots him firmly among the first Americans, descendants of a single migration that left Siberia and never returned. He carries within him the echo of Upper Cave 102, the woman from China, whose elongated skull recalls an early world before mongoloid flatness. 
the spirit of Anzic I, the Clovis child of Montana buried in ochre and stone. The spirit caveman's existence proves that the first Americans were not a separate people from Asia, but the continuation of a vast human story stretching across the steppe and over the ice. His face, neither fully Asian nor fully American, captures a moment of transition in our species, when isolation had not yet reshaped appearance, but migration had already redrawn the map. In scientific terms, Spirit Caveman rewrote the timeline of North American prehistory. In human terms, he restored continuity to a narrative that colonial science had fragmented. For decades, scholars viewed the first Americans through the lens of typology, seeking separate races, distinct origins, and isolated migrations. The new synthesis of genetics and morphology tells a different tale, one of unity, movement, and adaptation. He lived in a world of change, the last breath of the Pleistocene giving way to the dawn of the Holocene. Around him, lakes dried, deserts formed, and megafauna vanished. Yet his people endured, weaving their mats, hunting along receding shorelines, burying their dead with care. From his skull we see the echoes of Asia's deep past, from his genome the continuity that binds all indigenous Americans. He is not a mystery from outside the continent, but the very embodiment of its beginning. Spirit Caveman is more than the oldest natural mummy in North America. He is the living link between the Ice Age hunters of Asia and the First Nations of America. His bones carry the memory of a time when the Beringian Plain was a bridge, not a barrier, when reindeer trails led to new continents and families followed the sun across frozen seas. His face, shaped by ancient Asian genes, reminds us that human identity is not fixed in stone, but moulded by time, environment, and journey. His genome, shared by millions of descendants across the Americas, confirms that the people who first entered this land never disappeared. They adapted, flourished, and remain. In Spirit Cave, beneath the stillness of Nevada's desert, a man once lay in silence for ten millennia. Today, his voice has returned, not in words, but in the language of DNA and bone, telling us that the first Americans were both of Asia and of America, that we are all in some measure travellers on the same ancient road. Spirit Caveman is the bridge between two worlds, and through him the continents remember each other.